In this video, we'll explore five real stories of performers who died on stage. These shocking and tragic deaths happened in front of live audiences. We'll review each case, revealing what led to the moment, how it happened, and what followed. These are not just accidents. They're chilling examples of how life can change instantly, even in the middle of a performance. It was Good Friday, April 6, 2012, in Itarare, a small Sao Paulo, Brazil town. The community gathered for the annual Easter play, The Passion of the Christ, a tradition that depicted the final days of Jesus. Among the actors was 27-year-old Tiago Klimek, who was playing Judas Iscariot, the disciple who betrayed Jesus and later hanged himself. Tiago was an experienced performer, having participated in the play for three years. He was familiar with his role in the safety equipment which included a harness provided by the local fire department. The harness was meant to protect him during the scene where Judas takes his own life, a scene he had rehearsed multiple times. As the play progressed, the moment came for Tiago to enact Judas's voluntary death. The scene involved him jumping from a small ladder, simulating hanging from a tree. The audience watched, captivated by the performance. At first, everything appeared to be going according to plan, but then something went wrong. When Tiago jumped, the safety vest he wore under his robe shifted unexpectedly. Instead of protecting him, it tightened around his neck, cutting off his air supply. This looked like part of the performance to the audience and fellow actors. Tiago struggled to breathe for four agonizing minutes, but no one realized his danger. Janaina Carvalho, a fellow actor, was the first to sense something was wrong. When Tiago didn't respond to her scripted lines, she became alarmed. Realizing he was in danger, she and the other actors rushed to help. Nearby, Luis Carlos Rosner, a sandwich vendor, was approached by one of the actors. The actor urgently asked Luis for a knife to cut Tiago down. Despite initial hesitation, Luis handed over the knife, and Tiago was cut down and rushed to Santa Casa de Itapeva Hospital. Unfortunately, the situation was dire. Tiago had been deprived of oxygen for too long, causing cerebral anoxia, severe brain damage due to lack of oxygen. He was placed in a medically induced coma but the chances for recovery were low. For 17 days, Tiago remained in the hospital, his condition critical. Despite hopes for a miracle, on April 22, 2012, doctors made the difficult decision to turn off his life support. Tiago Klimek was pronounced dead that afternoon. Tiago's death stunned everyone. What was meant to be a symbolic portrayal of betrayal turned into a real-life tragedy. The play that brought people together to reflect on Christ's sacrifice now served as a tragic example of life's unpredictability. In the aftermath, an investigation was launched to determine how this could have happened. The harness and rope were taken to the Criminal Institute of Sorokaba for examination. Police investigator Jose Victor Bassetti led the inquiry, noting that the equipment had been borrowed from the local fire department and used safely in previous years. However, something had gone wrong this time. Investigators considered whether the rope's knot was tied incorrectly possibly contributing to the vest's malfunction. Another theory suggested that material from Tiago's costume became entangled in the harness, causing it to tighten fatally when he jumped. The investigation aimed to uncover the exact events leading to Tiago's death, but answers were slow to emerge. In April 2016, in a small village in West Java, Indonesia, a pop singer named Irma Bule took the stage for her final performance. She was 29, a mother of three, and known for her daring snake dance moves. Her real name was Irma Wati, but she was known to her friends and family as Eneng. Despite her modest background, Irma had gained local fame by performing with live snakes. This dangerous gimmick had earned her a spot in the competitive world of dangdut, a popular genre of Indonesian music. That night, Irma brought out one of the most dangerous animals in the world a king cobra. Known for its lethal venom, the king cobra is the world's longest venomous snake and can grow up to 18 feet long. Irma's snake was named Rianti, and it had not been defanged, meaning its venom was fully active and deadly. As the performance began, the audience watched in awe as Irma sang and danced with the snake draped around her shoulders. She had done this often, usually with non-venomous pythons whose mouths were taped shut but tonight was different. Rianti was not only venomous, but its mouth was also untaped, making the risk incredibly high. Irma had become accustomed to these high-risk performances because they drew larger crowds, which meant more money. In the world of Dangdut, 
where many young women from small towns or poor backgrounds competed for attention, every edge counted. A typical gig would pay around $20, but adding a snake to the act could bump that up to $25, a small but significant difference for someone trying to support a family. As Irma moved into the second song of her set, she accidentally stepped on the snake's tail. Rianti reacted immediately, striking Irma on her thigh. The audience gasped as Irma's body jerked from the sudden bite. For a moment, she stopped dancing and sat down, clearly in pain. The offstage snake handler rushed to her aid, pulling the snake away and offering her an antidote for the venom. But Irma, determined to finish her performance, refused the antidote and continued to sing. Irma continued her performance for the next 45 minutes, her voice carrying through the night even as the venom began to spread through her bloodstream. Initially, she seemed to be holding up, but the symptoms began to show. She started vomiting and convulsing. Her body was racked with pain as the neurotoxins from the snake's venom attacked her nervous system. Despite the agony, she pressed on, but the venom was relentless. As the performance went on, Irma's condition worsened. She began to lose control of her movements, her body seizing up as the toxins shut down her nervous system. Finally, after nearly an hour, she collapsed on stage. The music stopped and the crowd watched in stunned silence as the singer lay motionless on the ground. The snake handler and other crew members rushed to her side, trying desperately to save her. They administered first aid and quickly transported her to the nearest hospital. But it was too late. By the time they arrived, the venom had done its deadly work. Irma Buell was pronounced dead shortly after arriving at the hospital, her life tragically cut short by a single deadly bite. Irma's death shocked the local community and quickly made headlines across Indonesia and beyond. Many were horrified by the circumstances of her death particularly the fact that she had continued to perform for so long after being bitten. Irma's mother, Encom, later revealed that her daughter might not have known the snake she was using was venomous. Encom explained that Irma, referred to by her family nickname Eneng, was told to perform with the snake, and its mouth was not shut with duct tape. This revelation added a layer of tragedy to an already heartbreaking story. There was speculation that Irma may have used the snakes to protect herself from unwanted advances by audience members. Indonesian journalist Maid Supriyatma, who researched Dangdut music, noted that female performers often face harassment during their shows. Supriyatma suggested that Irma brought snakes to prevent unwanted touching from audience members. Tragically, the snakes meant to ward off danger ultimately caused her death. On May 3, 1972, Leslie Cameron Harvey, a 27-year-old guitarist from Scotland, died in a tragic accident during a live performance. He was performing with his band, Stone the Crows, at the top rank suite in Swansea, Wales. Leslie was known for his talent on the guitar and was a vital member of the band. Leslie was born on September 13, 1944, in Glasgow, Scotland. Music was a big part of his life from a young age, partly because his older brother, Alex Harvey, was also a musician. Leslie had the chance to join The Animals, a popular band then but he decided to stay with his brother's band, the Alex Harvey Soul Band. Later, he joined another Scottish band called the Blues Council. Unfortunately, in 1965, their tour van crashed, killing two members of the band, and the group disbanded. In 1969, Leslie joined the band Cartoon, which allowed him to tour in the United States, opening for bands like Led Zeppelin and Spirit. He also played guitar on a solo album by Morris Gibb of the Bee Gees, though most of that album was never released. Later that year, Leslie co-founded Stone the Crows, a band quickly gaining popularity. The band was managed by Peter Grant, who also managed Led Zeppelin, and Leslie's guitar skills became a defining part of their sound. On the night of May 3rd, tragedy struck during a concert at the Top Rank Suite. While performing on stage, Leslie reached for the microphone, which was not adequately grounded. At the same time, he was holding his guitar strings, creating a fatal electrical circuit. In an instant, a surge of electricity passed through his body, and he collapsed on stage. Despite a road crew member's efforts to disconnect the guitar and an ambulance being called, Leslie was pronounced dead on arrival at the hospital. Leslie's death was a massive shock to the music community. After this incident, the music industry started to take electrical safety more seriously. Venues began to implement stricter safety measures, and equipment manufacturers made improvements to prevent such accidents from happening again. 
Leslie's death also profoundly impacted his family and bandmates. His older brother, Alex, continued his music career, but was deeply affected by the loss. Stone the Crows, the band Leslie helped create, struggled to move forward after his death. Although they continued to perform for a while, they eventually disbanded. On June 29, 2013, at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas, the Cirque du Soleil show Ka was in full swing. The audience was captivated by the intricate choreography and high-flying stunts. Among the performers was Sarah Guyard Guillot, a 31-year-old acrobat and aerialist with over 20 years of experience. Sarah had been with the show since 2006 and was well-loved by her colleagues and students. Originally from Paris, she was known for her dedication to her craft and her work teaching young performers. As the final scene of Ka began, the performers prepared for a dramatic battle on a vertical stage, a demanding sequence requiring skill and trust in their safety gear. Sarah was lifted into the air as part of the act, but something went wrong. The wire rope holding her snapped, and she fell nearly 100 feet into a pit below the stage, out of the audience's view. At first, many in the audience thought the fall was part of the act, but the sound of Sarah's screams as she fell, followed by the shocked reactions of other performers, quickly made it clear that something had gone wrong. The show was stopped, and an announcement was made that the performance was over. The audience offered refunds or vouchers for future shows. Sarah was rushed to the hospital, but was pronounced dead at 11.43 p.m. Her death was the first onstage fatality in Cirque du Soleil's 30-year history. The incident shocked the company and the broader entertainment community. In the aftermath, Cirque du Soleil's founder, Guy Lalibert, issued a statement expressing deep sorrow for Sarah's loss and noting her talent and dedication. The show Ka was immediately suspended while investigations into the incident began. The Nevada Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, investigated what had gone wrong. The investigation revealed that a combination of insufficient training and a failure in the safety equipment caused Sarah's fall. The wire rope that held her snapped during her rapid ascent because it came out of a pulley and scraped against a sharp edge, causing it to break. OSHA found several safety violations and issued multiple citations against Cirque du Soleil. These included properly training performers and appropriately protecting them during the show. The fines totaled more than $25,000. The MGM Grand, where the show took place, was also fined $7,000 for exposing its employees to hazardous conditions. The details of the investigation showed the tragic nature of Sarah's death. She was a skilled performer and a mother of two young children. Her loss was felt deeply by her family, colleagues, and the community who knew her. In response, Cirque du Soleil thoroughly reviewed its safety policies and procedures. They committed to improving safety measures to prevent such a tragedy from happening again. Performances of Ka resumed on July 16, 2013, with the first show dedicated to Sarah's memory. Further investigation revealed that the speed of Sarah's ascent had played a critical role in the accident. The rope failed because of the rapid movement, which caused it to rub against equipment until it broke. This pointed to the need for better training and equipment maintenance, lessons that Cirque du Soleil and others in the performing arts industry took seriously. Sarah's death also drew attention to broader safety issues in the performing arts. While her accident was the most severe in Cirque du Soleil's history, it was not the first. In 2007, two performers were seriously injured during a performance of Zumanity, and in 2009, an acrobat died during a training session in Montreal. These incidents underscored the risks involved in high-stakes performances and the need for constant attention to safety. Sarah was not just a performer, but also a beloved teacher. At CircFit, the fitness and circus program she helped run in Las Vegas, her students and their parents mourned her loss. Many shared tributes on social media, expressing their sadness and her impact on their lives. In the months following the accident, Cirque du Soleil faced the challenge of moving forward while acknowledging the tragedy. Known for pushing the boundaries of live performance, the company had to confront the risks that come with such innovation. The lessons from Sarah's death inform future decisions for Cirque du Soleil and the wider industry. On April 15, 1984, British comedy unexpectedly lost one of its legends. Tommy Cooper, a well-known Welsh comedian and magician, was performing live at Her Majesty's Theatre in London. 
At six foot four, wearing his signature red fez hat, Tommy was famous for his blend of magic tricks and humor, often making people laugh with his intentional failures at magic. Something went wrong during a live broadcast of millions of viewers that night. Tommy performed on Live from Her Majesty's, a popular television program. He had done many similar shows over his long career, and the audience eagerly awaited his act. As the show began, Tommy took the stage to perform one of his well-known routines involving a large magic cloak. His assistant helped him put on the cloak, and the show's host, Jimmy Tarbuck, stood behind the curtain, passing Tommy various props to pull out of the cloak. The props got larger and larger, building up to the final gag. Everything seemed like typical Tommy Cooper, chaotic, funny, and unpredictable. Suddenly, Tommy dropped to his knees in the middle of the act. The audience, used to his comedic style, laughed, thinking it was part of the routine. But Tommy didn't get back up. He slumped forward against the stage curtains, and for a moment, even those backstage thought it was another joke. But as the seconds passed, it became clear that something was wrong. Still hidden behind the curtain, Jimmy Tarbuck noticed Tommy's limp body and realized this wasn't part of the act. The show's director quickly decided to cut to an unscheduled commercial break, a sign that things were serious. During the break, the stage crew rushed to help Tommy. His son, who was backstage, confirmed their worst fears. Tommy had a bad back and wouldn't have collapsed on purpose. While the crew tried to revive Tommy, the show's producer, David Bell, faced a tough decision. The show was live with millions watching. Should they cancel the broadcast or continue? After a quick discussion, they decided to continue the show. Les Dennis and Dustin G, the comedy duo scheduled to perform after Tommy, were sent on stage. They acted in the limited space available while Tommy's body remained behind the curtain. The audience, unaware of the situation, continued to laugh, not knowing that the comedian they came to see was in critical condition just a few feet away. After Dennis and G finished their performance, the curtain was carefully removed, and Tommy was taken out of the theater on a stretcher. He was rushed to Westminster Hospital, but it was too late. Tommy Cooper was pronounced dead on arrival. He had suffered a massive heart attack. Although the news wasn't officially reported until the following day, word had already spread. The comedy world was in shock. Tommy Cooper's death marked the end of a career that spanned over 40 years. He had spent his life making people laugh with his unique mix of magic and comedy. His death on stage, in the middle of a performance, was a reminder of how suddenly life can change. In the following days, there was much debate about continuing the show after Tommy had collapsed. Some thought it was disrespectful to go on while Tommy lay dying backstage. Others believed that it was what Tommy would have wanted. He had dedicated his life to making people laugh, and in a way he did so until the very end. The footage of his final moments has become controversial. Some see it as a tragic end to a beloved comedian's life, while others view it as a fitting, unintended final comedy act. One lingering question is whether immediate medical attention could have saved Tommy's life if the show had been stopped when he collapsed. Was the heart attack so severe that nothing could have been done? Or was there a chance he could have survived? Despite his sudden and shocking death, Tommy Cooper's legacy lives on. He is remembered for how he died and the countless laughs he brought to audiences over the years. His life and career were remembered for his ability to find humor in even the simplest things. And his death on stage proves the fine line between comedy and tragedy. Tommy may be gone, but his memory brings joy to those who remember him as one of the greats of British comedy.